So I'm going to, uh, I guess, switch gears, although talk about things that have really come up in these the, the great talks that you've already heard, um, just reinforce uh, some of the things that you've been talking about. Um, you know, there, there are some interesting, um, as you've heard, very exciting uh, research findings in MSA, and sometimes it's useful to have a little bit of knowledge about some of the, some of the, the science underneath those so that you can interpret what you're hearing. So I, I guess that's my major uh, objective, um, to, to switch gears a little from clinical research to basic research. So the first question, you know, really is why should we do basic research? We all want treatments yesterday for this disease. I think that's, that's clear. Um, but, but, you know, there's also the, the argument that, that it's hard sometimes to run before you can walk and that understanding something uh, can give us the best chances of really effectively treating it. So the assumption here is that if we don't understand it, we, we can't fix it. Uh, and sometimes that assumption is actually not true. Um, many successful therapies in medicine stem from careful observation uh, and chance, what we call serendipity, and, and not rational design at all. Uh, and that's probably especially true in neurology. Many of the things that we give to our patients um, you know, for a complex organ like the brain uh, emerged by chance over a period of time, sometimes hundreds of years of observation. But by and large, the 20th century and the early 21st century have really given us some remarkable achievements in, in human health, uh, and these span infectious disease, cardiovascular medicine, oncology and neurology, among many other disciplines, and, and many of these discoveries arose from basic scientific understanding of, of the disease processes that are involved. And so, um, and so there's hope that with more understanding, and there's really been, uh, you know, an explosion of understanding of, of the biology of MSA in the last 10 years, um, that these will lead to, to, to treatment. So one example I have here for a rational therapy is, is levodopa. So 50 years ago, you, you all know Cinemet, levodopa uh, for Parkinsonism, uh, the observation that that uh, that there was a depletion of dopamine in parts of the brain in patients with Parkinson's disease uh, that had been donated post-mortem, again underscoring the importance, um, I think, of, of brain donation, that observation um, led to, to the test, the first test of levodopa, which, which more than 50 years on is still a, a remarkably successful treatment for, um, for, for Parkinsonism. So understanding MSA may lead to disease-modifying treatments, and, and you've heard about, the, you know, been given the definition about that. We want to find out what causes MSA, because if we know the cause or the drivers, we can make models for the disease in the lab. And, and currently, as you know, uh, while there has been enormous progress, we haven't successfully translated a finding from a mouse into a human. So we probably do need to, to, to improve the models that we have in the lab. How can we track MSA progression? You've been hearing from previous speakers about biomarkers. If we can't track it or we can't diagnose it early, we're not going to have a clinical trial. And how can we prevent, ultimately prevent the disease, slow it down, or reverse it? So we've heard a lot about uh, proteins and protein folding, you know, uh, this protein alpha-synuclein. So I just thought I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go through again some of the principles here. So what you see on the screen here is a piece of paper on the left that's meant to represent a, a, a protein that's not folded uh, and, the, and the brain on the, on the right. So each of our cells um, turns out they're packed full of proteins. They're very high concentrations. They need to move uh, and they need to fold in exquisite shapes in order to perform their many, many functions. And we've got, you know, thousands of proteins uh, in each cell. And so typically they fold, and this origami picture here just, just represents a properly folded protein. They fold into appropriate shapes to perform their function. Uh, but there's diseases that can result from the misfolding of these proteins, which is this scrunched up piece of paper uh, at the bottom. And, and these are really uh, some of the, the, the biggest diseases we face really of our time, diseases of aging that lead to malfunction and death of cells in different, especially uh, very specialized cells and organs. And these diseases include Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, and of course, uh, MSA. 
They also include other diseases that are very common, even more common uh, than these diseases, including type 2 diabetes. Again, a very specialized cell that is subject to um, stress over time uh, that leads to the accumulation of toxic proteins and these cells can't cope with it. Because our brain cells by and large don't divide over time, we need them to encode the memories that we have from the time we were children. And so we can't keep turning them over like we can, for example, our skin cells. So if you put a toxic protein into a skin cell, it can take care of it by dividing a brain cell or a specialized cell that secretes insulin has a lot more difficulty doing with dealing with that problem. And so that's why these are really diseases of aging in specialized cells. And so in MSA, as you've been hearing, there's the misfolding of this protein called alpha-synuclein, uh, and it, it, it misfolds in a very specialized cell. Um, it misfolds in, in different types of brain cells, but in particular, a, a cell that, that Lucy mentioned, which was involved in the cabling or myelination of neurons which is basically putting that insulating sheath around the cables of, of, of brain cells, uh, and those cells are called oligodendrocytes. And what you see here uh, on the right side are, are little black spots, and those black spots are all this protein alpha-synuclein that is clogging up uh, this particular group of cells uh, in the brain. So, um, so what causes alpha-synuclein to misfold? And again, just focusing on the principles, um, there, are, there are probably many triggers um, for this um, process, but, but you know, and, and I think many of you have questions about, about either the genes, the genetic makeup, or what's in your environment. Uh, and so we like to think of complicated diseases like um, MSA as being a result of the in interactions between genetic you know, what you're born with in terms of your DNA, and they can be complicated uh, combinations of genetic factors, especially for, for diseases like MSA. And what's in your environment, what you get exposed to, and that could be, you know, in utero while you're in the womb, or it could be during life, but there are significant uh, environmental exposures we all have. And we tend to think that this combination of genetic factors and environmental factors, um, uh, it, you know, there's an interaction between these two that result in the misfolding of this protein that ultimately leads uh, to this disease. And, and these are very difficult, um, you know, we often get from our patients questions about, you know, I was exposed to something when I was a child, could this be, or, or as a young adult, could this be related to my disease? Um, you know, I have uh, an uncle who has Parkinson's disease? Do I have something that runs in my family? Uh, and these are really important questions to ask. They tend to be answered by having strength in numbers and a, and a lot of data. And so I think that's why you're hearing a common theme in the last few, in the last few talks is that we need to be tracking many numbers of patients carefully in these natural history studies that you've been hearing about in order for us to be able to answer those questions for you. Otherwise, we're in the dark, especially for a rare disease. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about proteins. This is a very dramatic picture. On the left side, you see a, a normal brain. On the right side, a very shrunken, uh, abnormal brain. Uh, and this is... Uh, this is triggered by a single, uh, a single shape change in a one protein in the brain known as the prion protein. And so there's a conformational, what you see on that, that little, that picture on the left is a, a properly sh a folded prion protein and then, and, then, and then a misfolded prion protein on the right. Uh, and that single protein uh, can wreak havoc in the brain whether you're a uh, human or whether you're uh, sheep, cows, etc. You've heard of the disease scraping sometimes known in cattle as mad cow's disease, uh, devastating disease either for humans or for animals when this particular protein simply changes its shape. So what is a prion? And I go into it because there is... Um, there are mentions of synuclein uh, and, and, and its prion-like properties, and particularly the connection of this term prion to MSA, which I think is a little confusing, so I thought I would cover it here. Firstly, what is a prion and what is seeding? What do we mean by that? So what you see here on the screen is a, a circle that's meant to represent a, uh, a, an, a normal protein, and then a, a protein that's in an abnormal shape at the bottom, which I'm calling here the prion conformation. 
And the reason prions are so devastating uh, and, and can be so potent and as to be infectious in the case of the prion protein itself is that when this normal protein meets the prion uh, shape protein, the normal one also changes its shape. And that is called, what you see here on the screen is templating, it's also called seeding. So it's like you're putting the seed of something in and you've got a whole bunch of normal protein, but once the normal protein sees the abnormal, it also changes shape. And you can imagine that amplifies the problem and it can, and it can then spread very quickly within a cell and also between cells. Now in the case of the prion protein, this, this mad cow's disease protein, it's infectious. And what do we mean by infectious? We mean that you can catch it um, through transmission between different organisms. Uh, and, and famously, that, that occurred through the eating of infected meat. And I, I think it's important to, to understand that there is no evidence that uh, any other protein that misfolds like this, um, there's no evidence at this point that they are infectious, okay? So I think that that's really important to stress, that people mean different things when they say prion or prion-like. Uh, sometimes they mean this biology, that, that what I'm showing you here on the screen, where an abnormal protein can make a normal protein misfold. And that's probably true for alpha-synuclein. It can do that under certain conditions. But whether something is infectious is entirely another question. And so I think it's really important important for us to not confuse those two things. So can alpha-synuclein behave like a prion? This is something you do hear and many questions uh, from patients uh, we get about this. So I think that there's evidence of prion-like properties that, I, as I just said, this ability to seed or template for this protein alpha-synuclein. Uh, some, um, some of this work arose because you probably remember that a number of years ago there was a therapy for Parkinson's where they would transplant uh, fetal dopamine cells into Parkinson's patients. Uh, what they observed when those patients died and donated their brain was that the fetal dopamine cells were also getting those alpha-synuclein aggregates in them, and that raised the possibility that there was some kind of spread from the person who had been transplanted into those fetal uh, neuron grafts. And so that was one of the first um, important pieces of evidence that, that synuclein may be uh, able to transmit between cells. Uh, and certainly uh, MSA synuclein can transmit to animal models and the laboratories of Stan Prusner, Virginia Lee have done some really nice and elegant work and have shown that this is a plausible mechanism of uh, alpha-synuclein uh, toxicity. Now, I, you can notice that I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully because when you actually look at the data here, uh, I think it's very compelling and it's very provocative, but there are always different interpretations to some of this data. And so some of the models that have been used are non-physiologic. For example, what do I mean by that? Synuclein exists at certain concentrations in the brain, um, but the ways in which this prion-like behavior have been demonstrated in the lab have been through forcing the synuclein to do things it wouldn't otherwise do, driving its levels really high, injecting um, uh, fibers of synuclein into the brain. And so, so it's always good to be a little critical and, and a little open about how these experiments are really being done because they are open to different interpretation. Uh, some of these experiments have used whole brain extracts. So, so for example, uh, some, some of this demonstration of spread has been through the injection of taking, um, taking brain extracts from a patient with MSA, injecting that into a mouse brain. Well, that includes synuclein for sure, but there are a lot of other things in a brain extract. And so we just, we have to be uh, careful uh, that we're interpreting this data correctly. Uh, nevertheless, uh, many labs have shown that this mechanism uh, is now very plausible and is absolutely worth uh, investigating carefully.
All right. Why is it important? Why are these studies really important? Uh, I think it's come up in previous talks, but they suggest that if synuclein is part of the reason that MSA is such an aggressive disease, for example, compared to, to some others in the, in the family of synuclein diseases, uh, then maybe lowering the therapies would be very important for MSA patients. Uh, and the seeding property, this ability of MSA protein to behave differently, MSA synuclein protein to behave differently, uh, and, and really a, a major discovery from, from the Prusner lab, um, may help us, um, if, it, if, it, if it holds water, to distinguish MSA from Parkinson's disease and other diseases. In other words, this property of synuclein may be an important biomarker. So it's important biology. So I, I think one of the things I was uh, uh, meant to do today was highlight a couple of the influential papers over the last year. And so uh, in this vein, I'm going to highlight a very interesting um, and uh, enormous uh, opus of work from Virginia Lee's lab that was published in Nature this year. Um, and what Virginia Lee's group, uh, Chao Peng and her group and others, were trying to understand was how is it that the synuclein protein leads to different diseases? Why, why in some patients do we get MSA, in other patients Parkinson's, etc.? cetera? And, and this is a very complicated question. It might involve genes, as we talked about, different environmental factors. But they took a, a, a different angle. They wanted to center around the synuclein protein. And they were asking this question, so why, why, why these different different diseases, and they broke it down to, to two important components. They knew two things about these diseases. They knew that in these different diseases, synuclein is, is, is shaped differently. Even though synuclein leads to, it, misfolding leads to these different diseases, it turns out that the shape in which, into which it misfolds in these diseases is different between, uh, between Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, or uh, MSA. And so they, they started with that uh, understanding. The, the, second, the second important um, feature they were looking at is not only is the shape of this protein different, but the cells that are affected in these diseases are different. For example, prominently affected in Parkinson's disease are dopamine neurons, prominently infected in dementia with Lewy bodies are cortical neurons, the neurons of, of the, the top part of our brain, the cortex. And in multiple system atrophy, we've already talked a lot about these insulating cells, these oligodendrocytes. So they started, and they, they're really asking, what, is it the shape of this protein that's really the most important factor, or is it the cell type, where it's doing its damage, that's actually the most important factor? And so the important conclusions from this study was that the synuclein that they were extracting from MSA uh, brain was certainly far more potent in creating disease in animal models, they were using mouse models, than, uh, than, than uh, synuclein from dementia with Lewy bodies or Parkinson's patients. Uh, and they, the major finding of this was the number two here, which is that the specific shape of MSA synuclein depends on that cell, the oligodendrocyte. So they um, make a very important point, uh, and, a, and a critical one, I think, that it is not just the protein, but it is the host cell environment that's really important. And that has implications for, for the way we think about the disease and, and for the way we think about treating it and also has implications for where this disease starts, whether it starts in the, in the brain cells, the neurons, or in these support cells, the oligodendrocytes. So, um, so um, the conclusion there, I'm just reiterated here, is that the oligodendrocyte appears to be key to the specific shape, what I'm calling a strain of synuclein uh, that is forming in MSA. Now, like with any great papers. This is, this is, I think, a terrific paper, but there were many scientific questions that were opened up. Uh, these models that they used are not, uh, there's a, a lot of artificial elements to this model. Again, a mouse model in which synuclein was abnormally expressed in oligodendrocytes is not really uh, necessarily a faithful model for what's happening in the human brain. Uh, and when you take extracts from MSA patients, as I mentioned, uh, there are many other things in those extracts, and I think I think uh, there are open questions about uh, whether some of those other components of those extracts were very important uh, in creating the effects here. Uh, and so one, uh, one avenue here that, that 
uh, is being actively pursued, I think, in many labs, including ours, is can patient-derived models, can we make human models of MSA that are maybe a little more physiologic than the mouse models that we have? And so last year when I was uh, uh, talking, uh, we, we spent a lot of time talking about patient-specific cellular models uh, and this technology that is known as IPS cells, where we can take a skin cell or, or another uh, adult cell, we can turn it on, back in time into an embryonic stem cell-like cell, and then we can generate brain cells uh, from our patients uh, with MSA. And so for the last 10 years, labs um, including ours, have been uh, through the generosity of patients, again, uh, patients who have volunteered for research, who have donated skin cells, but also, uh, and this is really pivotal, um, uh, many of our patients have donated their brains over the last decade that have really made this work possible. Um, it is now, we are, we are now in a position where we can ask some really important questions about this disease biology uh, in these kinds of cells. Now, when you don't have a gene mutation, this is a point that I made uh, importantly last year, it's very difficult to work with these cells. There's a lot of variability. So over the last few years, we have been developing technologies that I hope will be very useful for MSA, whereby we can generate uh, brain cells that you see here uh, on the screen very rapidly from patients. Um, the reason we developed this technology was because uh, if, you're, if you don't know what the gene is and you need a lot of samples, making brain cells from patients can take six months months, but now we have this process down to, to a, you know, 10 days. And, and so that, I think, is going to help us a lot. And we have engineered these proteins in a specific way. You can see on the screen here lots of green, uh, green fluorescent protein, GFP. Uh, and that is, that is lighting up and actually showing us where the alpha synuclein is aggregating in these cells. And so we think developing technologies like this um, that are still very much a work in progress are going to be very important for scaling up the production of stem cells, not for transplantation, uh, but for drug discovery. And so in previous years, I've described efforts that we and others have made in, in, in drug discovery for alpha-synuclein, um, but can we execute the same kinds of high-throughput, large number of molecule screens in brain cells from patients? That's a very open question right now, and so we need to develop new technology. So I think we're on the way to doing that. Um, many people are working on this, and I think that that holds promise uh, for drug discovery in MSA. So back to uh, some other um, aspects. I think we just talked about some advances in the, the protein folding field. But what about advances at the level of genes and environment? Uh, and so here, uh, there has been uh, exciting progress in the last year. I think it would be very it would be very satisfying to be able to tie the alpha synuclein protein directly uh, to multiple system atrophy in the same way that genetics has tied it to Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies and we really don't have that direct evidence yet and and part of that may be that we just don't have the large numbers um, that we that we do for for Parkinson's disease however one interesting observation reviewed here by uh, Henry Holden and colleagues nicely in a, in a recent paper, is that uh, a number of alpha-synuclein mutations, pa these are patients who typically have Parkinson's disease in, running in the family every generation. But when you look at the brains of some of these patients, uh, there uh, can be some striking pathology that looks like MSA. And so this is an indirect, an indirect piece of evidence that ties alpha-synuclein to MSA. Uh, and we have now in our lab generated stem cells from many of these family members, uh, including um, large multi-generation kindreds where we have stem cells from the whole family. And so, um, so these are going to be interesting models where we do know the gene defect. And I think they're going to be important for us to explore um, MSA modeling in the lab in human cells. Um, Shoji Suji and colleagues a number of years ago uh, had a very interesting paper uh, in, on, on this CoQ2 um, uh, protein, which is an enzyme that is involved in the production of coenzyme Q10. Can I actually have a show of hands? Is 
Is anyone here on coenzyme Q10 for supplementation? Yeah, I can see a, a bunch of you. So um, often we're asked, is there really any evidence tying this to, to MSA? And, and this particular uh, genetic uh, discovery from a Japanese group was, was very interesting. Um, it, it is controversial in the sense that it is not thought that the widespread mutations exist here across different populations. But it was an important discovery that if you reduce the amount of coenzyme Q10, you can contribute to brain disease uh, that, uh, that, is, that is really MSA in these rare families that are found in Japan. So it was an, it was an interesting study, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. Um, the same group uh, has also led an international consortium that has now started to uh, identify uh, different mutations, uh, and this one is the uh, GBA gene. So, so GBA is a gene that is involved in a disease called Gaucher's disease, and it's known that if you have carry one copy of this mutation, uh, you're at much higher risk than the average person of getting Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies. It is turning out that, that there are, is interesting data now tying uh, mutations in the GBA gene to MSA as well. And uh, there was recently a study uh, from a New York group um, at Columbia uh, that is also starting to see some of the same data. So that's another gene to watch. Uh, and it's critically important for us to identify these genes because this is how we, uh, how we understand what's really driving the pathology uh, in, these, in, these, in, in MSA patients. So this was that paper that was published in 2014 by uh, Dr. Suji and colleagues in the New England Journal um, uh, highlighting the CoQ2 mutation. And it's really nice to see when a group uh, follows their studies through with additional studies, and Dr. Suji's group is doing just that. So in the last uh, year, we've seen a couple of interesting papers from his group. Uh, one is that if you take that family that has the coenzyme Q deficiency and you do supplement them with coenzyme Q10, uh, it seems in the small numbers that they have that they have been able to stabilize the disease in those patients, which is, which is very interesting. Now, it is hard for us to conclude that if you don't have a mutation and we gave you coenzyme Q10, would that be beneficial? It's difficult for us to conclude that on the basis of this study, um, but it was at least, um, it's at least a clinical, the beginnings of a clinical study that can start to, uh, to, to, to address this issue. And recently, just I think a couple of months ago, uh, his group uh, and uh, Okano's group in Japan uh, made these iPS cells, these stem cells from patients who have this mutation. Uh, they did nice work um, by genetically correcting that mutation in the dish and showing that certain cellular defects in those cells were reversed. Uh, and if they were supplemented by coenzyme Q, they could also reverse those defects. So this is, I think, a really nice example of how basic research, you know, genetics and stem cell work, are coming together to start to build uh, more certainty uh, about what drives this disease and also give us better models, human models, in the lab so we can, we can use these to study our patients. So... Um, I think there are a number of questions on environmental exposures, and as I alluded to before, there are no definitive environmental exposures identified uh, for, for MSA. Uh, and so we, we do have those, as you probably know, for Parkinson's disease. Certain pesticides and, and other, um, other uh, toxicants are known to trigger Parkinson's, uh, or at least increase the risk of Parkinson's. Those studies, and I'll give you an example, uh, some of the studies were performed by Beata Ritz, who's a professor at UCLA, um, and, and she has a, a really beautiful way of analyzing um, exposure of patients who live you know, in farming areas uh, with Parkinson's and their exposure to pesticides. And it's very quantitative data. It looks at exposure risks uh, across a wide area, across a population that's very well characterized. But the reason she's able to draw nice conclusions from that is really numbers. So once again, it's all about strength in numbers and having the patience. And for a rare disease, it is harder for us to make these inferences. So what's slowing us down? Rarity of the disease. Um, for genetics, um, 
It is possible that MSA is driven uh, by private gene mutations. And what do I mean by that? But certain genes or gene combinations that are just occurring in small populations or in isolated families, uh, and that means it's very hard to replicate because human genes have actually diverged quite a lot um, over the last few thousand years. And so I think the, the, the example in Japan is a great one. Finding a mutation in a Japanese family doesn't necessarily translate to, 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 to a mutation in a Caucasian family living in the United States. And so, so this is a challenge for a rare disease. Uh, and the same thing for uh, environment. Uh, we need, we, it is possible that there are environmental triggers for this disease. Uh, it, I think a lot of data would suggest that there must be for MSA, but they could be diverse. And with a rare disease, if you have a lot of different environmental triggers, it is hard to pin them down. But there is hope, and these kinds of models that we're now building, these human models in the lab, are really um, exciting because we can take individual patient stem cells, we can expose them to potential toxins, and we can start to conclude uh, whether these might be triggering the MSA-like uh, pathology. Okay, so all of this is only enabled by basic science advances. And the theme here is it's going to take a village. I think this is a common theme that's come up in the last few talks, that it's, we're going to need to partner with you, clinicians, scientists, and patients, in order to, uh, in order to, to, to figure this out. Um, and for a rare disease, and I think it's, it's important, uh, for a rare disease, we're going to need some serious innovation. So, so the kinds of studies that are possible for Parkinson's at a population level are, are going to be very challenging for a rare disease like MSA. But we now have a lot of different techniques to, to address this. Some of these are called computational. You might have heard the term machine learning. There are, there are new techniques that we have um, you know, that, that can use uh, computation very powerfully to make up for the fact that we don't have strength in numbers um, in the patient population. So all of this is under the umbrella of basic research, not just doing the same for MSA that we did for Parkinson's, but developing new technologies that can be applied to a rare disease. Finally, um, uh, how does some of this basic science relate to biomarkers? Uh, I think you've heard about these, but, but the synuclein work uh, is relating to, I think, uh, work that, 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 that Daniel alluded to in blood, spinal fluid, uh, for tracking synuclein. Very challenging, but, but there are new ways of doing this now. Um, I think one of the holy grails in the Parkinson's and MSA field is going to be to discover a PET scan that can actually track alpha-synuclein in the brain of living patients. Many of you will know that immunotherapies for Alzheimer's disease are starting to show some real hope in early clinical trials now after 15 years of work. The critical, the critical component of that success has been the ability to image the amyloid protein in the brain of living patients. We need the same uh, technology for, uh, for synuclein. Uh, Coenzyme Q we mentioned as a gene, but there's interesting work on using coenzyme Q as a, as a biomarker. There's this protein neurofilament light chain. I, I mention it because you may hear about it in different uh, talks or, or in different publications. This is an interesting marker. Basically, the idea here is if you look at the neuron on the right, uh, neurofilament is a, is a protein that's, that's highlighted here in blue over here. Um, and so this particular protein, when the, when the brain cell, the neuron gets damaged, it gets released, and so you can track it in the spinal fluid, and there is growing evidence that, that it, it might be an interesting biomarker in different neurodegenerative diseases, including MSA. So it's certainly one to watch. Uh, and uh, Daniel has mentioned um, imaging. Uh, I think there is... Um, uh, advances in looking at brain inflammation in imaging, uh, another type of cell called a microglial cell. You might hear about that. A lot of exciting work about the role of this particular brain cell in neurodegenerative disease and some really nice imaging that can now allow us to track uh, these, these brain cells also. We have just completed actually in our group a small pilot study of one of these and it's looking, um, it's looking promising, uh, but again, it needs, it needs more numbers for us to be sure. Uh, Daniel mentioned brain iron as well uh, and the work of, um, of, of various companies on that, including Prana, who are, who 
are here in the audience. So that's all I have to say. I, I think I leave you with the same message as last year. This is one of my fabulous patients and her son, um, who's she's still climbing mountains and inspiring uh, us all. And uh, I, I really I, I want to give a, a salute to my colleagues in the, on the MSA coalition on the board. I, I it's a it's a real privilege to work with them uh, and see how hard they work as patient advocates uh, for for all of us and for all of you. So I thank them and uh, and thank you and all my other patients, uh, caregivers, for the inspiration. Thanks so much.